You're now listening to the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Where we put you in the driver's seat every week, all year long. In the NASCAR racing world, from top news stories, latest results, and best fantasy lineups, we'll have you up to speed and out in front before the drop of the green flag. So let's dive in with our host, Vanilla Wafers. The 2023 season is officially underway as we just got done with the first points paying weekend for the Truck Series, Xfinity Series, and of course, the Cup Series. All of it came from Daytona International Speedway where we saw a 200 mile event, 300 mile event, and the Daytona 500. Lots of action, some surprise drivers making it into the Great American Race, lots of passes for the lead, all that excitement. We're going to talk about the biggest takeaways from each race here on the Fantasy Filler Podcast. How's everyone doing? I I think it was a great first weekend from what I saw from each of the races. Yes, it seemed like every single finish had its controversies, but overall, the races were a lot of fun. Seeing the cars back on the track at Daytona International Speedway was great. The Daytona 500 went without uh, any problems with weather, which is something that's always very important. And it wasn't really a wreck fest. Granted, there was quite a few wrecks near the end, but not to the point where it was very obnoxious. So I say overall, for brand new fans, they they had to enjoy what they saw on their televisions or even at the live event. And for the NASCAR racing fans, I'm pretty sure you're excited for how this race turned out. Maybe you're not as excited for who won the race, but still, it was overall a good time. Now, I know in the past, the way we used to do this was I used to go through the final results of each race. I would go all the way back to the top 10 for the Truck Series and the Xfinity Series and point out a few drivers who were not able to finish in the top 10, but were still worth the recognition. And then the Cup Series, I went all the way back to the top 20 and talked about almost every single driver anyways that went outside the top 20, except for like five drivers. I think it's time to change that up a little bit. I think we're going to do the focus on the top 10 for all three series. And I think for the Trucks and Xfinity Series, I'm going to group it all together because I feel like the takeaways were decent in the last couple of seasons, but I think we can do a little bit better and just get to the meat and potatoes of what we want to talk about in each of these events. So without further ado, let's dive into the final results here at Daytona International Speedway. All right, let's first start off with the truck series race that happened on Friday, the Next Era Energy 250, where we had 42 trucks enter into the race. Only 36 could run in the main event. So the six that missed it out on it was the number 45 of Lawless Allen, the number 28 of Brian Dezant, the number 96 of Todd Peck, the number 12 of Spencer Boyd, the 04 of Caden Honeycutt, and the number 46 of Norm Benning. The 46 truck was a pretty interesting one as usually the driver, I think the driver who was going to run that truck for this race was going to be Johnny Sauter, but something must have fell through between him and G2G Racing, or I think it's good to go racing. And so they had Norm Benning come in. Uh, Unfortunately, they still were not able to make the race. I think the first thing we got to focus is on the ups, and then we'll look at some of the downs. The biggest up being the winner of this race, the number 38 of Zane Smith for Front Row Motorsports had himself a great run there at the end and got pretty lucky with the weather. Unfortunately, this was a rain-shortened event. It was supposed to go 100 laps. It only gets to 79 laps, but he is picking up right where he left off last year where he wins the championship. He also won the biggest race for the Truck Series last year, and now he wins the biggest race of the Truck Series this year. It's going to be hard to beat Zane Smith. I don't know who can really compete with him at this point. I mean, who do you, who do you got? You got the drivers from Thor Sports. You got Ben Rhodes, Matt Crafton, also Ty Majeski, but Ty Majeski is more of a top 10 driver. Nothing against him. I just feel like he's not a champion driver. I just feel like he's a very consistent driver, which is probably something that this team needs. So not bagging on Ty Majeski. I just don't think he's going to be at the same level as Zane Smith. Uh, What about some of the other drivers? I mean, there were some drivers who competed against him in that championship four, obviously. Where are those guys at? Well, Chandler Smith in number 18, he moved on up into the Xfinity series. Uh, He's now with Colleg Racing, so he is no longer a competitor against him. What about John Hunter Nemechek? He he always has a good run with Kyle Busch Motorsports. 
Well, now he's up with Joe Gibbs racing the Xfinity Series. Who can really compete against Zane Smith this year? It's going to be very interesting to see. And right now, I don't see anyone at the same level as him. I have people who can compete against him from time to time. But overall, Zane Smith is starting off the season strong. And I think it's just going to be a phenomenal year for Front Row Motorsports. Big up for Zane Smith and that team. They are just going to have themselves a stellar year. I can feel it. From going from the most impressive driver, let's talk about the driver who was the most disappointing. I think we got to give it to Chase Elliott in the number 35 truck. We were expecting him to compete up front. I, I mean, that's typically what happens when you see some of these cup drivers move down. He led no laps. and He, he didn't get any stage points. He finished 10th overall. I don't know what it was with that 35 truck. It was not in a competitive side, but that was so weird to see Chase Elliott struggle that much for being a 2020 champion and also for the talent that he has at Super Speedways. We've seen at Atlanta, we've seen at Talladega, and even here at Daytona. And for him to get beaten by that many drivers and not really be much of a factor, it's kind of a big disappointment for Chase Elliott fans who may or may not r- watch these truck races all the time. If you're a fan of him, you expect him to do great in these lower series. That's why these Cup uh, Series drivers go down here to get some extra practice, and that just wasn't the case. The biggest underdog in this race that really did impress us, how about Christian Eckes in the number 19 truck for McNally Racing? And I'm gonna. Uh, this, this is the reason why I say he was the most surprising. If you guys aren't aware... Christian Eckes used to race for Thor Sports in the 98 truck. He wasn't going to sign back on with the team. He moves on over to McNally Racing during the offseason. And this is his first race with the team. This team has missed out on making the Truck Series playoffs two years in a row with Derek Cross. And they were like the last truck every single time. It was a bummer for this team. Christian Eckes goes out there, leads 19 laps, wins a stage. And if the weather would have played in his favor, he would have been the Best truck out there, in my personal opinion. Zane Smith uh, had himself a good truck as well, but the only one who was really keeping up with him was Christian Eckes, as well as a couple other drivers. And so I was very impressed by this run. Hopefully this team can keep this consistency going. Obviously, a super speedway race is not going to be the equivalent to mile and a half in short tracks. We know that already, but this is a step in the right direction that they absolutely needed. And you could throw Kobe Howard in that mix as well in the number nine truck. Kobe Howard used to drive for McNally Racing. Now he's with CR7 Motorsports, I think is what they're called, which is a very low budgeted team. And he was able to finish fourth, lead two laps. That That is very great for a small team to run that well in a race that is as important as Daytona International Speedway. I'm not expecting wins from this team. Not by, not by a long shot. They're a very small team. But if they're able to get top 10s here and there, that will be a successful season for Kobe Howard and CR7 Motorsports. Could be a good dynamic that this small team needs. The biggest down overall was the race finish. I mean, we had rain throughout the entire time plagued this race. From the very beginning, like lap number three. And it just never ended. You, you, at the end of the stages, you just see weather coming in. You're just like, oh, no, we don't we don't want rain. Come on, just stay away, just stay away. Please, I'm begging you. And finally, it hit us on lap number 69. They stayed out on the track for 10 laps, and then we were red flagged for an hour. And they finally get the track dried up, and then it rains again, and the track is lost, and NASCAR gives up. I don't think you can blame NASCAR on this. We saw small cells. We were hoping they were going to go by, and they just hit at the worst time. It is what it is, but we're not going to have a memorable finish from this now. You, you, honestly, you're going to think of this race six months later and be like, what happened? Zane Smith won, but I don't remember the finish. Oh, yeah, it rained out. There's not much you can do. You're living in Florida. It's just going to be the weakest race out of the weekend. So let's close it out through the rest of the top 10. Obviously, Zane Smith was the winner. Tanner Gray was able to finish second. Christian Eckes in the 19 finishes third. Kobe Howard in fourth. Grant Infinger in the number 23 finishes fifth. Ty Majeski in the 98 finishes sixth. Tyler Ankrum in the number 16 finishes seventh. Corey Hyman in the number 11 finishes eighth. Matt Crafton in the number 88 finishes ninth. And the round of the top 10 was the number 35 of Chase Elliott. And the other Cup Series driver that we should mention here real quickly, Corey LaJoy, finished 23rd overall in this race. 
Now, going on over into the Xfinity Series, we had 44 cars enter into this race. Six cars had to miss out since the field can only be a maximum of 38. Those six cars being the number 66 of Dexter Stacy, the 91 of Josh Balicki, the 99 of Garrett Smithley, the 13 of Timmy Hill, the 36 of Alex LeBay, and the number 74 of Ryan Vargas. The biggest two names out of there were the 13 and 66 MBM Motorsports. It looks like they're cutting back on a lot of stuff, and they were hoping to make this Daytona race, and both their cars miss out. Big disappointment for this team. Um, there's a, It's just a down. You, you don't want to see small teams struggle this bad, but unfortunately for Carl Long and his team, it's, it's starting off on a bad note, and I'm just hoping that they can pick things up and at least keep one car running full time. The biggest winner was obviously the winner himself, the number 21 of Austin Hill, led 39 laps in this race, and the race unfortunately ended under caution due to a massive wreck happening on the back straightaway that took out Sam Mayer as well as others, but when you look back at the reviews, it was clear that the number 21 of Austin Hill was the leader, and he had himself a phenomenal car throughout the entire weekend. He wa- he was able to finish on the pole. He had to start in the back because he had radio issues at the beginning of the race, and he was still able to win stage one. That's how good this 21 car was. I, it was going to be really hard to beat him. There were some people who were kind of competitive to him, but overall that 21 truck was, or truck, see I'm still stuck on the truck series, the 21 car was the strongest overall. And Austin Hills has proven to everyone that when it comes to super speedways, he is the guy. I know it's a damn shame that he missed out on running the Cup Series race, But if he doesn't get caught up in that wreck, he would have been able to make it in no problem. Connor Daly just had nothing for that 62 machine. Biggest disappointment in this race. This is kind of going to be low-hanging fruit, but College Racing did not have anything uh, for this race at at all. Out of their three cars, the number 10 of Justin Haley, the number 11 of Daniel Hamrick, and the number 16 of Chandler Smith, they led a combined total of one lap. That was Justin Haley. You, you don't expect that from this team at this racetrack. And they just they just struggled in the Xfinity Series as well as the Cup Series. I don't know if they're just not focusing nearly as much. Maybe because of their dynamic, it, ha- it has split up a lot. I mean, A.J. Allmendinger's now up in the Cup Series. You had Landon Castle, unfortunately, getting booted because of his sponsorship woes. And it, it definitely bled into this race. And uh, for a team that you expect to be running up front... They just didn't really do it. I mean, yeah, Chandler Smith was close to winning the first stage, but that was really the only highlight to come from this team. In the end, uh, Justin Haley finished 10th, Chandler Smith finished 12th, and then Daniel Hammer gets caught up in a super early accident on lap number 1920, and he is out finishing 36 overall in this race. A driver who really impressed me in this one that I did not expect to be running up front at all was Parker Retzloff, and shame on me. And a lot of us for thinking that he was not going to run up front because I don't know if you guys were paying attention, but last year when he ran a few races for RSS Racing, he had himself some really good performances. And I mean really good performances for the equipment he had. So I understand why Jordan Anderson decided to pick up Parker uh, for a full-time ride. There's a lot of potential there, and he showed it here in this race by finishing fourth. Uh, Granted, it's, it's, it's a wild card race in a way. I mean, there's going to be some people who are going to dominate, and then there's some people who are able to sneak up front. But Parker Retzloff just was there when it mattered the most. He's done it in the past with RSS Racing. So I'm kind of curious on what he's going to be able to do here with this 31 car and see if he can do a better job than Myatt Snyder. That would be pretty interesting to see. I mean, he was already beat, he was already able to beat him in this race. I mean, Parker finished fourth, and then Myatt Snyder finished right behind him in fifth. And give a shout out to RSS Racing as well, uh, while we're on the topic of them, as they were able to get two of their cars in the top 10. Joe Graff Jr. in the 39 finishes 7th. Ryan Sieg in the 38 finishes 8th. Now to go back to more criticism, let's talk about another team who struggled near the end. And this wasn't due to poor performance. This was just due to being kind of bad teammates. There's no other way to put it. And that is Junior Motorsports just basically choking at the end when they had all their cars up front. It, Justin Allgaier led 36 laps in this race. Sam Mayer in the one fin- uh, led 14 laps. Josh Berry in the eight uh, led 17 laps. And Brandon Jones, he did not lead any laps, but he finished fourth in stage number two. 
Only one of those cars was able to finish in the top 10. Now, here's why that happened. We were in single file formation near the end of the race. Kind of a bummer that it was happening, but unfortunately, that sometimes just happens here at super speedway races. Uh, I think there was a little bit of pandemonium uh, throughout the entire race that not many people were too excited about. I, I mean, there wasn't really many big wrecks. You had the incident that happened on lap number 42 and then lap number 21. But other than that, nothing really that big. But at the end, everyone wanted to make it to the finish, so they went single file. Now, everyone thought to themselves, oh yeah, Junior Motorsports has this figured out. They got all their drivers together. They're going to do just fine. And then they backstabbed each other. I think the one who did the most backstabbing was Justin Allgaier. I get he's hungry to get this Daytona win. He's been trying for so many years. But he throws Josh Berry out of his line to try to go and pass him. Then the caution goes out. And basically all the friendships and all the partnerships just ends right there. Which is absolutely crazy. This is a bummer for Junior Motorsports because you just had them kind of do something similar to what they did last year in the championship four. You had every single position except one, which was Ty Gibbs, who occupied that position. So it looked like they were going to win the championship, and they don't do it. They they fall short, and Ty Gibbs wins. And now in this race, you had all four drivers up front, and you make the big mistake, and you only get one driver finishing in the top ten. Just, just an absolute bummer. Uh, now, granted, you also had Sam Mayer get caught up in an accident as well, but it, it still shows that there may not be as tight as they should be as an organization. Now, I could be wrong. It could be just the greed of Daytona. We'll have to see. But that, that just a little bit of a bad showing by them. Um, I don't know who you really blame on that. It's just for the antsiness to try to win the race. But Justin Allgaier finishes third. And then Brandon Jones in the nine finishes 14th. And then you got Josh Berry in the eight finishing 26th. And Sam Mayer finishing 27th. After he gets caught up in a big accident where he ends up upside down but not nearly as scary as the number 31 of last year. So it's still a wild incident on the last lap, but not to the same extent. Now let's look at the racing. I'd say the racing was up all the way to lap number 100. You had a lot of people passing, trying to get up front, and nobody really stayed in the lead for that long. You had Justin Allgaier lead between lap 59 to 74, but other than that, everyone else was leading for about like four to six laps at most. So... There was a lot of competition going on up front, which is always really fun. And you're going to wonder who, how the pit strategies are going to play out, who's going to be able to go out in front of who. We didn't really need to see that too much here in this race as we had uh, quite a few cautions to fill in for that. But still, it played a lot of strategy overall and played a lot of excitement up front. So that's a good up and that's always something that's enjoyable for the fans. It was a shame that it could not last there near the end. As we talked about, a train was running around the track for about the last 20 laps. Single file racing can always kill a super speedway hype. And unfortunately, this was the only time we saw uh, that happen was here in this Xfinity Series race. which I just wish we wouldn't see that at all. I I hate to feel like the drivers are just trying to finish the race out and then do whatever they want in the last three laps. It's it's kind of just leaves a sour taste in your mouth. It is what it is. Now, the biggest thing to talk about, I say this for the end on purpose, was the finish. Now, we already had a controversial finish with the truck series. Well, the same thing bled on over here into the final laps of this race as the race ended under caution because Sam Mayer went upside down and they were not going to let them race to the end. I mean, you can't do that. You need safety officials on the driver right away if the car gets up into the air. The question was, who was going to win the race? Now, looking at replays, it was clear Austin Hill was in front. You also had John Hunter Nemechek right there at the bottom, running below the yellow line along with Myatt Snyder, and everyone's thinking, well, did they win the race? Should John Hunter Nemechek get the victory? And then they were like, no, because of the double yellow line rule. Well, is he going to get penalized? And then this whole controversy starts up once again on how the double yellow line works. I hate that we're still having problems officiating this rule. It is such a bad rule. I know the intentions of this rule. 
you don't want cars going down on the apron. You don't want someone to run into somebody as they're getting off a of pit road, or you don't want anyone to run on the apron when the grooves are completely at different angles, which could cause an immediate accident. I understand that, but we cannot seem to make a consistent call because I felt like if Justin Allgaier moved them below the L line, forced them down the L line, he should be penalized. If John Hunter Nemechek was not forced down, then him and Myatt Snyder should both be penalized and sent to the back. That's always the way the rules worked. They said, nope, Austin Hill wins it. And then second place is John Hunter Nemechek. Third place is Justin Allgaier. Fourth place, Parker Retzloff. Fifth place, Myatt Snyder. Just the way the field was frozen. Doesn't matter about the yellow line. I don't... Come on, NASCAR. We, we got to get some consistency with this. Either be consistent with calling it or get rid of it. There, there's just no other way to put it, and this was another pure example of that. Uh, overall, this race was another good one. If I had to rate it out of 10, I would probably give it a 7 out of 10 just because of the final lap being ran in single file and then the controversial finish. But Austin Hill was able to do the same thing as Zane Smith, get back-to-back wins at the first race of the season. Now let's move on to the biggest race, the one that everyone is talking about, the great American race, the Daytona 500. <laughs> At least we got the best race saved for last, as the Cup Series had themselves an action-packed race where 42 cars entered, only 40 could run in the main event. Two cars missing it out was Austin Hill in the number 62 for Beard Motorsports and Chandler Smith in the number 13 for Colic Racing. Uh, drivers who were able to make it in by speed was Jimmy Johnson in the 84, Travis Pastrana in the 67, and the ones in the duels were the number 50 of Connor Daly, which is still just crazy to say, and the number 36 of Zane Smith. We had eight cautions for 38 laps, 52 lead changes amongst 21 different drivers, meaning more than half the field was able to lead at least one lap here in this race. And it came down to an overtime finish where drivers, nerves were at their absolute peak. Everyone was doing everything they could to run up front, which led to an accident between Eric Amarola bumping into Travis Pastrana. And which caused a bigger accident. So the caution waved immediately on the final lap. Field is frozen and they got to go back to replays to see who wins the race. And it was Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Collecting his third Cup Series victory. The other two coming from uh, Super Speedway races as well. The first one I think was Talladega. The second one was Daytona. And now he wins the biggest race of them all, the Daytona 500. After leading 10 laps, the 47 car somehow, some way, finds a way to make it to the finish. Now, if you were able to listen to the last episode when we were talking about fantasy picks, we did not have Ricky Stenhouse Jr. on our list. And we kind of feel like fools, but at the same time, it was it was just looking at the path, this driver has not been able to finish in the top 10 in the last five years at Daytona. So the two wins were at Talladega. I I made a mistake on there. He hasn't won at Daytona until now. But how about that? Another shocking winner here in the Great American Race. I just feel like we're just doing nothing but surprise winners. Just back to back to back. You have Michael McDowell in 2021. Then you got Austin Sendrick, a rookie winning the Daytona 500. Now you got Ricky Stenhouse Jr., just the journeyman of NASCAR at this point. Which, which is crazy to say, this is a X Fandy Series champion who just was never able to really get any big wins while he was running with Roush Fenway Racing and here with JTG Dortry Racing. This is his first win with this team, but now they finally put everything together, get this big win, and I'm happy for Ricky Stenhouse. He didn't wreck anybody at all in this race. I know he gets a bad reputation of causing cautions and taking people out. He did not do this in this race. He ran himself a pretty clean race and was able to get the victory. Finishing second right behind him, Joey Logano, the number 22, made it to the finish. Made it to the finish. I knew he was going to be a front runner, but I did not know if this man was going to actually be able to finish here in this race. And he was able to do it. Uh, came very close to winning his second Daytona 500. He was just came up just a little bit short. And then Christopher Bell. Guy who struggled the most at Daytona was able to be there at the end. The top finishing Toyota of this race. And I know people had Denny Hamlin and Bubba Wallace as the top performing Toyotas. I don't think hardly anyone had Christopher Bell being up there. But Christopher Bell is actually starting to become a really good driver here in the Cup Series. I mean, he made it into the championship four. And now he's doing good at racetracks where he has struggled in the past. Well, how about a top three finish in the Great American Race? 
Rounding out the top five, Chris Buescher, Alex Bowman. The pole sitter, Alex Bowman, actually has himself a clean race here. Able to finish fifth overall. Chris Buescher, great run for him. He looked to be one of the strongest cars here in this race. Uh, RFK Racing as a whole did great. Brad Keselowski, unfortunately, gets caught up in an accident on lap there near the end and finishes 22nd. I was going to say lap number 211, but... That doesn't mean anything because we're, we were only expecting 200. Basically, the overtime. He wrecked in the overtime. And he finishes 22nd while his teammate, Chris Buescher, finishes 4th. They had themselves a really good run, and I will not be surprised if you see one of those cars in victory lane, either at Talladega or the final chance race at Daytona because, man, just great performances once again by these two. It's a shame they were not able to get the victory. Uh, rounding up the top 10, AJ Allmendinger in the 16, the 99 Dan Suarez, Ryan Blaney in the 12, the one of Ross Chastain, and the number 15 of Riley Herbst for Rick Rare Racing. Definitely probably the second most shocking person to finish up here near the front, and I, I'll talk about the most shocking one. He finished right behind him, but Riley Herbst goes from being spun out on pit road Goes laps down. I think he went multiple laps down at one point, And he was able to get them both back. Restarts there near the end, like in 28th. And he's able to finish 10th. Stays out of trouble. Make his way on through. And has Rick Rare Racing a solid top 10. Hey, we're used to seeing David Reagan do that. But how about a rookie? Or, yeah, it's it's his, I think it was his first race in the Cup Series. And finishes 10th. Good job for Riley Herbst and good job for Rick Rare Racing. They just find a way to just stay out of trouble when it comes to the big ones. I mean, they still had trouble in this race. Uh, but th this is like normal for them, especially at Crown Jewels. They just find a way to stay out of it all, make their way up on the lead lap, and get a decent finish. So good for them. And the most shocking one of that top five besides him is Ryan Blaney. Now, why do I say Ryan Blaney? He gets caught up in a huge a accident at the beginning of the race that takes out him, Chase Elliott. Let me look real quickly. Some other drivers who got taken out. Tyler Reddick, Martin Trex Jr., Eric Jones, Kyle Busch was a part of it. Kyle Larson was kind of a part of it. Daniel Suarez and number four, Kevin Harvick. All of them caught up in an incident on lap number 119. And it looked like out of all of them, Ryan Blaney was the one who was not going to be able to continue on. He was the best finisher out of everyone who had that accident. In fact, he was able to finish 8th on the lead lap. Don't know how he, how he did it, but just the way Daytona works, sometimes you'll just get that junker out of nowhere that's able to get a solid finish. It happened last year in the last chance race. I'm pretty sure it happened last year in the Daytona 500. It, it just so happened to be Ryan Blaney. Unfortunately, he does not get the Daytona 500 victory that I know a lot of people had him as a favorite. But still for him able to wrap up with a top 10 after all he went through, I'd say that's a pretty good job. <laughs> Let's look at the people outside the top 10, 11th through 15th. Travis Pastrana in the 67 finishes 11th. The number four, Kevin Harvick, 12th. Zane Smith in the 36, 13th. Cody Ware in the number 51, 14th. And then Martin Trex Jr. finishing 15th. A combination of drivers who were running near the back, went a lap down at one point or another, or getting caught in, in a wreck. That was these guys in here. Uh, definitely the most surprising out of these five. It's it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, you have some surprisers in here. Cody Ware finishing 14th. That's huge for that team. I'm so glad Rick Rare Racing was able to get both their cars to finish 10th and 14th. I think the only teams that were able to beat them that had all their cars finished ahead of them was Trackhouse Racing. Everyone else had at least one driver finish worse than uh, Rick Rare Racing. So good run for them. Zane Smith was the top finishing front row motorsports car. I expected him to finish on the lead lap. It was actually really shocking that he struggled as much as he did. But for him to recover near the end was good. But Travis Pastrana, biggest shocker here in this race, finishing 11th. Good for him. Good for him. I, I No one expected him to make it into the race. He makes it in, stays out of trouble all the way until the very last lap, which wasn't even his fault. And he's still able to finish 11th. Great performance. Great performance. Hope he gets another opportunity like that because that was fun to see Travis Pastrana do as good as he did. It looks like it's only a one-and-done deal, but man, that was cool. That was cool to see someone who struggled in the Truck Series and Xfinity Series, but everyone loved him so much, get one last opportunity to run the biggest race, and he did it. 
and he had himself a really good run overall. 16th through 20th, we got Corey LaJoy, Denny Hamlin in the number 11, the number 5, Kyle Larson, the number 8, Kyle Busch, and the number 23, of Bubba Wallace. The drivers that everyone thought were going to be front runners in this race, minus Corey LaJoy. Uh, Denny Hamlin was not the best driver uh, uh, in this race. Never really was. Uh, had himself no stage points and only led six laps. Pretty big shocker. He was obviously there till the, at the end, but got caught up in an incident. Uh, but not a great performance for Denny Hamlin. I expected more out of him. Number five of Kyle Larson. He had himself actually a really, really good run. He didn't get any stage points either. But there near the end, he was a factor. But... As everyone must understand, he struggles so much at super speedways. Something was bound to happen, and it happened to him where he finishes 18th, only gets 19 points. Armani talked about it. There was a reason why you shouldn't put him on your list for fantasy, and you shouldn't bet on him, because he struggles at these racetracks. Even when he looks really good, even though if he has a fast car, he gets caught up in something. And trust me, there are way better races for him. The most heartbreaking one, Kyle Busch at the 8. God, everyone wanted Kyle Busch to win this 500, and... He had every opportunity to. It seemed like everything was thrown at him. He gets caught up in early incidents. He's in a backup car. He's He has a one final restart where his teammate's going to be below him. Is it going to work out? He's able to get there. And then Austin Dillon gets taken out by William Byron. He doesn't have a partner. And he also gets caught up in an incident there at the end. The big one with uh, Travis Pastrana and Eric Amarola. Will Kyle Busch ever win the Daytona 500? After this performance, I have hope. I think this was his closest opportunity he's had to winning the race since the late 2000s when he was at first with Joe Gibbs Racing. But, ah, oh, what a heartbreaker. I, I feel it coming for him. I really do. But it could be a Tony Stewart incident where he's just not able to win it. He is now 0-18 at the Great American Race. Just He's so close. He's so close. We'll just have to see if he's able to do it next year or the year after if he's still racing in the Cup Series. Bubba Wallace always looks good at super speedways, but he hit the wall in the middle of the race, and I think it was due to a bump, and now I think it's a good time to talk about it, because uh, we, we're talking about Travis Pastrana, Eric Amarola, we also had Bubba Wallace with his incident, and then early in the race, we had Joey Logano bump Kyle Larson, they got sideways, I don't know what it was about those Fords, but they struggled with bump drafting, like really bad, whenever they went and hit the back of a car... It just, it just got them so loose, so out of control, and I don't know what was going on there. I don't know if there is any opportunity for them to fix the car at this point. I mean, I think their beds are made, but it was so weird to see how much Ford affected a car in front of them when they did a bump draft in the corner. And even in the straightaways, I think Bubba Wallace, who did he get hit by? I think it was Eric Amarola or Martin Trex Jr. I can't think of it at the moment. But whoever bumped him from behind made him hit the wall. He went a lap down for quite a long time, was able to get his lap back. And even though he was running a little bit better, like at the end and was in the top 10, it, it killed all his momentum. So very unfortunate for him. From 21st to 25th, we got Eric Amarola, Brad Keselowski, Austin Sinrick, Noah Gregson, and Ty Gibbs. Rookies did decent in this race. I wouldn't say they did spectacular. Ty Gibbs was definitely the best performing rookie out of the bunch. A whole bunch of two. <laughs> um, but n not really anything to, to stand out-ish for these guys. I mean, nothing compared to Austin Sendrick last year. So they're just trying to get their experience under their belts. And for these two to kind of struggle a little bit like they did back in last season with Ty Gibbs running the 45 and Noah Gregson running the 16 from time to time. They just need to get some more solid finishes. And I and I feel like they'll happen. It's still very early in the season. Brad Keselowski led the most laps in this race. He finishes 21st, gets caught up in an accident. What a damn shame. Brad Keselowski is another driver. He's with Kyle Busch. Just has so many opportunities to win the 500. Great at super speedways. I mean, he's won six Talladega races, and he's won the Daytona race in the summer. So he he's he definitely has what it takes. But he was similar with Richard Childress Racing. They got broken up and they got caught up in an incident. Well, the number six did, but an incident happened, broke them up even more, and they were never able to get back grouped together, and it really just ended their chances of winning the 500s. Uh, Brad Keselowski, I know he has more opportunities um, at this race once again, and he has proven to everyone that their super speedway program is top-notch. They just got to get to the finish. 
I said it in my video, Brad Keselowski is usually in the garage before the checkered flag flies. He was close to making it to the checkered flag, but he still wrecked out at the end. 26th through 30th, you have Harrison Burton, Todd Gillen in 38, Michael McDowell in 34, Connor Daly in the 50, and the number 78 of BJ McLeod. BJ McLeod, Connor Daly, good for them to make it to the finish. They were kind of struggling, but they were the last cars running in this race. Everyone from there on back is out of this race. So, a top 30 for BJ McLeod and Connor Daly, so good for them. But the biggest names here is Front Row Motorsports. Front Row Motorsports typically have really good runs at super speedways. I almost put Michael McDowell on my list every time we come to Daytona. And he just got caught up in an incident, and he was never able to really recover, and went multiple laps down. He was able to finish fifth in the stage, but... A little bit of a disappointment for all the Front Row Motorsports fans to not have a single one of their cars finish in the top 10 of the Great American Race. You almost expect it. Rounding up the field, we're going to go from 31st to 40th. You have Jimmy Johnson in the 84 and 31st, Justin Haley in the 32nd position, the number three of Austin Dillon, 33rd, uh, William Byron, 34th, Chase Briscoe, 35th, 41 of Ryan Priest in 36, Eric Jones, the 43 and 37th, the 9 of Chase Elliott in 38th, the 45 of Tyler Reddick in 39th, and you round up with Ty Dillon in 40th. All these drivers minus Ty Dillon got caught up in an accident. William Byron caused his own accident. He took out Austin Dillon as well as a lot of other drivers. You also had um, an incident there at lap number 181, I believe. I think it was 181. Um, that took out multiple drivers. I think the drivers were Kevin Harvick, Martin Trex Jr., Ryan Priest, Chase Briscoe, uh, Ty Gibbs, and the 34 car. That was a really bad wreck for Stuart Haas Racing. But the, those drivers all ran really well in this race, especially Ryan Priest. Finished second in one of the stages, and he fin- and he led four laps. So Ryan Priest right now, two for two. Just, just got to finish the race. That's the important thing. He has to finish. And unfortunately, he's not been able to do that. But out of these 10 drivers, who I think had the best performance overall that nobody was really expecting, was Jimmy Johnson. God, I wish he finished this race. He had such a great one in that 84 car. And it was so great to see. He just has bad luck at at Daytona for the most part. Yes, he has two Daytona 500 victories. He's been caught up in multiple incidents in the summer. He got caught up in almost every single accident in the clash except for 2019 when he won it while everyone else wrecked behind him. It just it just always gets caught up in someone else's uh, wreck. But, ah, oh, I wanted to see that 84 finish in the top 10. It was so great to see him be able to do that. Kind of a shocker. People were a little nervous about him returning. Well, look how well he ran. It's almost like he never left. Did get the lead any laps, which kind of surprised me. But, hey, being around in the top 10 for as long as he did, it was overall really great to see. The racing was absolutely fun from almost beginning to end. You had fun pit strategies throughout the entire race. Green flag pit stops at super speedways are now really fun to watch because back then you used to only have like two groups. We had like five groups every single green flag pit stop. And so you didn't know who was going to be where. And that was really fun. And the racing, for the most part, was mostly side-by-side. You had a lot of fun watching that. Uh, one At one moment, you had the bottom line doing really good. Then another moment, you had the top line. You just really didn't know which line was the strongest. And the restarts were also fun. Again, you just didn't know who was going to have the better run. It all mattered on how they were able to push. No controversies there. Just a really fun Daytona 500 that I think people are going to enjoy the highlights. And for any newcomers, they came and they saw themselves a really decent race. And I have a feeling they're going to be coming back next week. And for Auto Club, if they really enjoyed what they saw on TV. And I think they did. Except for one thing. The commercials. I felt like this year, commercials were more rampant than ever on Fox. And I like the people at Fox. I like Larry McReynolds. I like Mike Joy. I like the, I like their commentary team. But Fox's camera work, as well as their commercial runs, are just some of the worst. It's so bad sometimes. I, I wish they could do something like they do with the NFL or baseball, where when they find a break, that's when they throw their commercials. Or, or something like that. Or or just stay with the side-by-side commercials. It just felt like they threw everything they could at any waking moment. I felt like it was just such overkill just how many commercials there was. But then I guess maybe they're trying to promote, hey, you should come to the races so you don't have to see this. But I don't know. If you're going to show that many commercials, just keep it side-by-side. I mean, you're getting your advertisement out there. People see it. 
I, I just don't think a full screen commercial during green flag that many times is necessary. I mean, if you want to do full, full um, screen commercials, you had plenty of cautions in this race, eight for 38 laps. I'm telling you, you would have got all your commercials in, no problem. Uh, overall, great race. I, I really enjoyed this race, and I see a lot of people did. I, I'm doing a poll right now on YouTube, uh, YouTube channel Vanilla Wafer, and out of, let's do a quick refresh here, out of, looks like about 100 votes, uh, we have 86 people saying that they enjoyed the race. 14% didn't, and I think that's really good. Uh, really good for a super speed rate race. You want it to always stay about above 85%. That means overall, it was a lot of fun. I give this race an 8 out of 10. I would give it a 9 out of 10 if it finished under green flag, but unfortunately, cautions don't bring the most exciting finishes or memorable finishes. But the intensity was great. The strategies was great. The racing was a lot of fun. And I think NASCAR started off on a great note here for the 2023 season. So those are the biggest takeaways from the Truck Series, Xfinity, and Cup Series. That will conclude today's episode, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Before we close out, let's talk about the top five performing fantasy drivers of this week. We had Ricky Stenhouse Jr. as the top performer with 48 points. After him was Chris Buescher in number 17 with 43. Joey Logano in the number 22 with 42. Then you had Alex Bowen with 41 points. And then the fifth spot, you would have had the number one of Ross Chastain. If you want to join us in fantasy, you still have plenty of time. You can join our league at fantasygames.nascar.com at Fancy Filler League. If for some reason it does not want to pop up, also try Field Filler League. I heard some people were having some issues with that. But we have currently 46 people uh, that were entered into this first one. You still have plenty of time. Don't worry. If you miss the first race, it happens and you're going to be able to catch back up. Now, don't wait for multiple weeks because if you wait multiple weeks, then there's no chance for you to win. Top three performers was Nitro Menzer. I think he's brand new to the league. Welcome, good sir. And you scored 200 points. Only person to score anything higher than 180. Good job to you. Crazy Corrado. He's been here since the beginning. 177 points. Good job. And then Sammy, by God, you were able to score 169 points. Those were the top three here this weekend. I didn't do too good. I finished 12th with 149. We're, we're starting off on a rough note. But again, if you want to join that league, you can do so at fancygames.nascar.com and look up NASCAR Field Fair League. Anyone can join. It's a lot of fun. And hey, since NASCAR's doing fan rewards, you also get rewards for participating. So why not? It's a win-win. Now, if you want to see me on social media, you look up Vanilla Wafers. I pop up at Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. YouTube, I just released a brand new video talking about the 10 driver greatest drivers who have not won the Daytona 500. And as of today and uh, for the next year, those 10 are still not winners of the Daytona race. So I've kind of spoiled some drivers are on that list, but still it's a good watch and I really enjoyed making it for you guys. TikTok, I post daily NASCAR videos. It's more comedic, but sometimes trivial at the same time as I am able to do the guest of NASCAR driver that a lot of people enjoy. And then the fun stuff is the NASCAR therapy where we kind of poke fun at drivers, uh, just be a little more lighthearted. That one's a lot of fun and people seem to really enjoy it. And then if you want to talk to me during race day, uh, reach out to me on Twitter. I had a few people reach out to me and it was a lot of fun to to, uh, see what you guys thought about the race. And hopefully we can get more people to join on there. And maybe, just maybe, we will have a Discord group where we can watch this, the races together. We tried something like that today. Experimented it with uh, Armani as w- from the Motorsports Ministry and Will from NASCAR Opinions on Twitter. And if this works well, well, we'll probably do some live stream for you guys. And we'll all watch the race together. And I think that will be a lot of fun. Now we have reached the end of today's episode. I have been your host, Vanilla Wafers. I've been able to lead you to the front of the field, so why don't we grab that checkered flag, do some burnouts, and head on out. So you all take care. This has been the Fantasy Filler Podcast. <laughs>